Uh, and so it's really a great pleasure um, to welcome everyone today. Um, uh, we've gathered an incredible group of scholars, of scientists, engineers, architects, and designers to, come, to explore and come closer to defining this question of embodied energy. I wanted to first start uh, by thanking both David Benjamin for his leadership in conceptualizing this conference, as well as for Ted Hathaway and Old Castle Building Envelope for its generous support in making today possible, and as part of a longer investigation of this question at the school. This great collaboration between Columbia GSAP and Old Castle Building Envelope follows on a number of previous initiatives, such as Engineer Transparency, the Columbia Building Intelligence Project, and the Future of Energy, which have all strived in various ways and at different scales to open up new lines of inquiry in support of cre creativity and innovation and towards imagining alternate modes of design, of construction, which can all foster a more sustainable future for the built environment. One definition of embodied energy is that it is the sum of all energy required to produce, transport, assemble, and dispose of any product or building element. In this time of great environmental engagement and concern, the question of how architects and designers can explore and embrace questions of energy through materials and construction is more than ever not only urgent, but also a possibly endless source of inspiration and innovation as we will see today. But what I think is even as if not more interesting about the concept of embodied energy is that it can in fact converge so many varied questions and focus them into the very real materiality of buildings. First, there's the question of scale. Embodied energy enables us to tie the extra large scale of vast territories of resource extraction, of material transformation, of human labor, and of transportation to the scale of a single material, at once reconnecting the spatial scales of environment from the scale of a territory to that of a city, a building, or a brick. Embodied energy is like an exquisite meal which converges the entire world onto and into the frame of one single plate. Embodied energy also invites us back into architecture, the scale of time. How long did it take for material to become? What will it take to maintain it? And how will it age and finally decompose? It brings back to architects' consciousness this temporal dimension we seem to have lost in this age of high-speed design, high-speed construction, and more critically, high-speed global urbanization. As such, embodied energy converges everything we are craving for as architects, for architecture, but also for the future of cities and of the environment. Moving beyond the constructed binaries of the past decades, it converges again form and performance, the extra small and the extra large, the here and the there, the past and the future, the pragmatic and the poetic, the real and the imaginary. And so today we're really thrilled to welcome all of you who are leading in design innovation and thinking, not only through your exploration of new material technologies or new modes of conception and of fabrication, but also through your critical and engaged radical new framings of the questions we really need to ask how and why, if we are to advance the fields of architecture and design towards new forms of knowledge and of practice and ultimately of action. And so to introduce the day, uh, please welcome David Benjamin. And thank you all for being here. Uh, well, it's great to be here. And I want to thank all of the speakers uh, for making it uh, here um, with uh, associated kind of scheduling issues um, and uh, coming from uh, long distances. So uh, I'd like to first start by personally thanking Old Castle Building Envelope and CEO Ted Hathaway, um, and also our Dean of Columbia GSAP, Amal Andreos, for their commitment to this issue and this discussion and making this possible. Um, and I'm just going to give a very brief introduction, um, and then we'll get on to the other speakers for the day. Um, but I just wanted to kind of start at the beginning and um, note that we all know that architecture plays a significant role in global climate change. Buildings account for about 30% of uh, solid waste in the United States and Europe. They account for 33% of global carbon emissions, and they account for about 40% of global energy consumption uh, and uh, increasing. 
But the story of uh, energy and architecture also involves a kind of striking twist. Uh, in the past 50 years, operational energy, defined as the energy for things like heating, cooling, and lighting, uh, has actually declined as a percentage of total energy consumption in buildings. And at the same time, embodied energy, defined as the sum of all energy required to extract uh, raw materials, then produce, transport, and assemble the materials of a building, that has rapidly increased. Um, this can be understood in large part due to increased efficiency in heating, cooling, and lighting. And of course, the natural extension is that a so-called zero energy building um, would actually not have zero energy uh, overall, but it would have 100% embodied energy and 0% operational energy. Um, of course, we should note that these numbers depend on methodology and boundaries, and they vary widely between studies. Um, and of course, the absolute numbers are as important as the relative numbers. But uh, nevertheless, this trend is, is widely noted, um, and the trend makes embodied energy an increasingly urgent topic for architecture. Uh, but then we might ask, where exactly is all of this embodied energy? Um, it may actually be in the insulation of this passive house. Um, and what are the forces involved? Uh, how is embodied energy actionable? And maybe most importantly, how might architects design with embodied energy? As a starting point, we might study the breakdown of embodied energy by material. So here we see that metals and plastics have comparatively high embodied energy uh, compared to some other materials. But of course, we should note that this is normalized by weight, and it might look different if it was normalized by volume or normalized by structural performance or by the useful life of a material. Uh, we also might look at the breakdown of embodied energy by building component, and here we can see that uh, structure, envelope, and services contribute almost three quarters of the initial embodied energy. Um, but I guess it's also important to note that finishes have the highest increase in recurring embodied energy, and again, this depends on boundaries. Are we measuring just the building or the associated infrastructure? We could also study the breakdown of embodied energy by process, and here the extraction of raw materials and processing contribute the most, but trends in recycling and lower energy consumption in the use phase are having an impact on these calculations. And it's also important to consider life cycle factors beyond embodied energy, including consumption of raw materials, land use, longevity, source of energy, and end of life cycle processes. Maybe one of the best ways to understand what's going on with embodied energy is to compare specific buildings. In this case study, a new timber tower involved only slightly less embodied energy, um, but actually about 75% less embodied carbon than a comparable 50-year-old concrete and steel tower. So which number should we base our decisions on? And finally, to think across industries, we might translate these numbers into something more intuitive. In other words, if we look at the embodied energy in the new Shanghai Tower, we could convert it to something like 34 million cars on the road for a day, or something like 481 million pounds of coal burned. And this gives us a sense of scale, perhaps. Um, but again, the question is, how is this actionable? Uh, I think um, it's uh, clear to me that there are actually no clear answers and formulas to this issue. There's no single framework that seems sufficient to address all of the important questions. So for this symposium, as Amal said, we've brought together many different disciplines, including architecture, design, art, history, material science, biology, chemistry, engineering, waste, and supply chains. And the talks and discussions will be structured through three different lenses that may be helpful for thinking about this topic. First, scale, including uh, the size of buildings' materials uh, to the size of global supply chains. Second, uh, space and time, including the locations of production and consumption, as well as the duration of buildings. And third, a kind of spectrum between quantitative and qualitative including metrics and narratives that we use uh, alternatingly um, to uh, articulate energy and the associated issues. Um, so in a way, the aim of this event is to think deeply uh, and also to think broadly about this topic. 
to raise important questions, to challenge typical assumptions, to de discard default solutions, and to open up new possibilities for design. So my final note is that um, this is an environmental issue, but this is also a design issue. So it's an environmental issue because it deals with energy, um, but also because embodied energy is an increasingly important factor in architectural carbon emissions and therefore in climate change. So it's a climate change issue. Um, but that's all, this is also a design issue, uh, and it's, it's that not only because architects select and specify materials that have more or less embodied energy in them, but also because architects perhaps have the potential to redesign systems that are much larger than buildings, systems that involve global flows of energy and raw materials. So in my own recent thinking, partly due to my work with grown and biodegradable materials, uh, I can't help connecting architecture to time and food, um, actually two things that Amal also noted. And for time, I'm thinking that maybe architectural materials should no longer be considered as static and permanent, um, but instead as dynamic and transforming. And perhaps architects could actively design these transformations, not only design buildings, but design these processes and transformations. Architects can study where, material, where matter has been, they can specify how matter takes its shape in building blocks, and they can plan where it ends up going. And in this sense, in addition to managing the technical performance of energy, architects should also choreograph the, the, really the acts of embodiment and disembodiment, and ultimately perhaps uh, redesign uh, the experience of time. And finally, for food, I'm thinking about the chef and writer Dan Barber and his recent explanation of how our initial thinking about the farm to table movement uh, turned out to be wrong. So according to Barber, and I'm quoting here, science teaches us that the answer to understanding the complexity of something is to break it into its component parts. It insists that things need to be precisely measured and weighed, but interactions and relationships cannot be measured or weighed. Our belief that we can create a sustainable diet for ourselves by cherry picking great ingredients is actually wrong because it's too narrow minded. We can't think about changing the parts of our system, we need to think about redesigning the system. So then Barber picks wheat as an example, and he describes how a local New York farmer uh, that he met recently grows a sustainable emmer wheat and resurrects a kind of long lost flavor that is part of uh, the contribution to Barber's own award winning cuisine. And then Barber notes something else that he learned from this farmer, and he says here, the secret to great tasting wheat is that it's not about the wheat, it's about the soil. So basically the farmer here is designing the soil, not the wheat, and he's doing this through rotation uh, farming and working with the larger system. And I guess my thinking is that by extension, maybe we could say that it's important to simultaneously design the grain, the soil, the food plate, uh, and even new tastes. And I think this is very relevant and interesting for buildings and building materials. And with this in mind, I'm looking forward to some new flavors of architecture in the near future. Thank you.